Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me now where we left off last week to Matthew chapter number 5 and 6 and 7. Matthew 5, 6 and 7. Uh, by the way, if you weren't here last Sunday, um, you're not going to miss out. Uh, it's not going to get confusing. This is kind of part two of last week's message, but um, you, you would not have had to have been here last week. Should have been, but you, you, you didn't have to be here last week uh, to get uh, caught up into where we are today. So uh, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Last week we, we really talked about making a choice um, <clears throat> to continue in the status quo uh, to stay um, really uh, in a survival mode, if you will, in your life as a child of God, or really to make the choice to go on to discover uh, something new and fresh and vibrant that God had in store for your life. Now, here's the deal about God. Because He loves us, He allows us to have that choice. He allows us to make the choice to remain as we are, survive, to keep the status quo. Or he gives us the option and the choice to discover what it is he has for us. Now, I made that choice um, a long, long time ago, almost 50 years ago. This coming uh, Mar uh, April will be 50 years that I... I made the choice. I no longer wanted my life to continue as it was. But I, but I wanted Jesus to make a difference in my heart and in my life. And I want to tell you a couple of things about that. I'm not perfect now. Never have been. Never will be. And uh, I still experience a lot of pressure uh, in my life. And, and it's, it's just not an easy road. It's a difficult road. Uh, decision to make. It's a difficult road to walk, and you do have a lot of pressure. Now, let, let me give you two or three areas where I feel pressure. Um, I feel pressure in my life that I am not good enough for God. Now, you have to understand where I came from as, as a kid growing up. I was in a church that told me that if God approved of me, if God accepted me, uh, one of the signs of him accepting me in my salvation would be that uh, I would um, be gifted with this special gift. And uh, I, 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 really, um, I really wanted that. I, I really wanted God's approval. I wanted God's acceptance. And uh, frankly, uh, I could have faked it and pretended, but I really wanted the real thing. Uh, but then when it became evident to me um, that, uh, you know, <laughs> I wasn't going to have that, I finally just kind of turned my back on God completely, and uh, I began a life of pretense. Um, and, uh, but, but it just never felt like from that moment on uh, that I wasn't good enough for God. I still feel that way from time to time, uh, that I'm not good enough for God. Uh, and and I, I would see that God is holy and God is just and God is righteous. And I would look at my life and, and I'd be, a, I'm, I'm just a mess. I'm just a mess. But God came in the person of Jesus and he bridged that gap between my mess and his uh, holiness. And he wants a relationship with me. He loves me. And he cares about me and he wants me to spend eternity with him. But there are still a lot of times in my life that I feel like that I'm not good enough. The second area, I feel pressure. I feel pressure from you. Now, that's not your fault. But I do. I feel pressure from you. Every Sunday when I'm sitting down there, uh, that, that pressure to get here uh, because you, I, feel, I feel like that you have an expectation that I am better this week than I was last week. Preacher, can you identify a little bit with that? Uh, there, there is that pressure. I feel it when I'm in a restaurant. I, I, I go out to eat and I'll walk in the door of a restaurant 
And, and I kind of just search the room and immediately I'm watching people as they're doing this number and they're whispering it and they're making that, you know. And, and, and I'm supposed to know who those people are. Now, we've got a big television audience. There's, you know, over 2 million people that have access to our television program. And so, really, wherever I go, I kind of see that. I see the look on their face. I say, yeah, there's some people you don't know us, you know. And, and, and there were some people walked up to me just in the last day or two and, and, and just talked as if we were just the best of friends. And, and Kathy would say, well, who was that? I said, I don't have a clue who that was, you know. <laughs> so I've got that pressure. And then I've got the pressure um, that I put on myself that I, you know, I'm, I'm at my age, you would think that I would be, you know, I'm, I'm looking at myself and thinking to myself, you know, I'm putting pressure on myself. At my age, I ought to be more Christ-like. I really, at my age, I ought to be a whole lot further down the road in my walk with God than, than I really am. And, and, and people perceive that I've got it all together. And so what happens is you take the pressure of not feeling that you are good enough for God and that the people's expectations and the pressure that comes from that and the pressure that I put on myself, what happens inevitably is is that I fall into a performance mode. I fall into this area where uh, I begin to live like somebody that I'm not, uh, that I've got it all together. And so I perform. Now that's, that's enough about me. I, I'd rather talk about you. <laughs> What about you? Do you, ever, do you ever feel like that you're in a situation, that you're in a circumstance, that you have to perform in a lifestyle really that you don't possess? Do you ever get in a situation sometimes when you feel like that you have to act like that you've got it all together? I, I wonder how many people are in, in this room today that really talk a better game than you live. Anybody here? Uh, you don't have to answer, but anybody here like that? Basically, now here's, uh, here's what we're saying. If you can't live out God's way on your own, and if we uh, can't follow the teachings and the person of Jesus Christ in a genuine and in an authentic way, we will pretend to. We will act it out. We will hide our flaws and our faults uh, and our shortcomings from other people and we will wear this spiritual disguise to be somebody that we really are not. I put out on social media yesterday. Now for us older folks in the room, social media uh, is Instagram and Twitter and, and Facebook, <laughs> and it's called social media, all right? So I, so I put out, it, it was so interesting to me, I put out the question, do you ever get into a circumstance when you feel like that you have to pretend, when you feel like that you have to act, do you feel like that you have to be somebody that you're really not? And it was so interesting, a pile, a pile of people uh, answered in, 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 in that and it was really interesting to me. And, and some people say, yeah, I do when I, when I get into my small group, when I go to life group, I feel like I have to be that way because I feel like I'm around people that are much more spiritual than I am and I don't want to be seen as deficient so I act like somebody that I'm not. Somebody said, yeah, when the storms come, when difficulties arise, and, and, and I know that I'm expected to be this kind of person, but inside I'm falling apart, but I don't really show the other people around me who I really am, so I act like I've got it all together. You, you wouldn't believe some of the answers that came as a result. Last week, Jesus challenged us to be different. He said, I want you to be salt and light. I, I, I want you to be the kind of person that when other people are around you, they sense God about you. I want you to be the kind of person that's light of the world that not only do they sense God about you, they see God in 
you. I want you to be that. I, I want your life to be lived so that people can observe and they can see the difference that's in your life, that they see what you do and how you live and they sense God about all of it. Oh, but now go with me to verse 1 of chapter 6. Okay? Verse 1 of chapter 6. But take heed that you don't do your good deeds before men to be seen of men. <laughs> Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Whoa! Hang on. Chapter 5, let your light shine. Let everybody see. Chapter 6 says, hey, if you're doing it for people to look and see, then you've lost your reward. Am I the only one in the room that senses that there's a little bit of a contradiction here or seemingly a contradiction? Because he uses the same terminology. Good deeds, good works. Be careful that you don't be seen of men because if that's what happens, then you've just lost your reward. In chapter 5, he says, let everybody see. What's up with that? What, 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 what's he communicating here? He's talking about the difference between good works and righteous deeds. Righteous deeds are those things that God does in you privately. That God does in you personally. Uh, and sometimes when God does something in us that is so personal and so private, the ugly temptation then is to put that on the display to impress other people about the spiritual depth of our life. And we want to show it off and impress them. And the word says, when you do that, you've lost your reward. So the real question here this morning that we're going to pose is, whose applause do you really want? Do you want the applause of other people or do you want the approval of God? What's it going to be? What's that going to look like in your life? One is finite and one is infinite. To me, it's a no-brainer. But the fact of the matter is, it is our choice. If you put your righteous deeds on display, then you've lost your reward. Why? Because the very moment that you put out for everybody to be able to see what God has done in your life, then what you have put out there suddenly has become impure and you've just received the only reward you're going to get, and that's the approval of people. When we get to the point that we say, hey, look at me, check me out, see how spiritual I am, that's all the approval you're ever going to get. I love the practicality of Jesus. I love that he just puts things down on the level of where we live. And he's going to do that right here. And what the Lord is saying to us in this passage in chapter 6 is we as we make our way through here, Jesus is saying, I care more about your inner deeds than I do about your outward displays. All right? When does that happen? All right, here we go. When you give, you must give without attention. You must give without attention. Do you, you ever, you, you ever been tempted to say, Wow, do you, did you, do you know what so-and-so put in the offering basket this morning? Did you see what they gave? Wow, I've never seen anything like that. Look at what they're doing. Watch this now, beginning in verse 1. Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore... When you do your alms, when you do your giving, don't, don't sound a trumpet before them as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, well, they got their reward. But when you give your giving, don't let your left hand know what the right hand's doing. 
that your alms, your giving, your good deeds may be, may be in secret. And your Father which sees you in secret himself shall reward you openly. So what we're talking here about is when you give, give without attention. Now, when you read this, these four verses, it looks to me like that Jesus is giving this extreme illustration. And it would be like in a little bit when we're taking the offering and the ushers come down the aisle and there's some dude in the building that's going to give his offering that day and accompanying his offering, he's got a marching band blowing the trumpets at the same time that he puts his off. In other words, drawing attention to what he is giving in the offering basket. He said, be careful uh, about that. You, you know, I, I don't really like to, to say this, but I, I really have had people from time to time come and brag to me about their giving. Now, first of all, your pastor doesn't know what you give, how much you give. I, I don't do that. The only time we really ever verify giving is when somebody becomes ordained in this ministry. And then the only question we ever ask is that, are, are they regular givers or, or do they appear to have the appearance of tithing? We don't ask how much. I, I couldn't tell you what one person in this church gives. I have no earthly idea what people do give. So here's the deal about it. But I have had people come from time to time and they get, hey, preacher, you just know that I helped you build that building down there. Hmm? Uh, and, and, and they're real obvious about it. Now, there's several ways that you can give it. Here's you can give online, and a lot of people do. Matter of fact, we, we're exceeding 50% of what comes into this ministry now comes online. In the privacy of a telephone, in the privacy of a computer at home or wherever, they give online. Last week was an amazing demonstration of that. Then, of course, the kiosks are out there that if somebody, you know, forgets their offering or wants to give that way, that they can go give the kiosk right behind the screen so nobody will ever know what you've given. Then there's the offering time when we celebrate and worship with tithes and offerings at the end of the service. It's a power thing. But here's what God's word says. No matter when it's taken, no matter what you do, when you give, give without attention. Now the second thing he says is that, he says when you pray, pray without performance. Do you know, <laughs> this is awful. Some people pray like they're in an audition. And, and they, they pray like, you know, they, that it's a contest. And in some way, in some means, that if, if they just pray uh, and, and they win this contest, they, they're going to be Jesus Jr. or something. I, I don't really know. Watch verse 5. You ready? Here we go. When you pray... Don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when you pray, get in the closet, shut the door, pray to the Father in secret, who sees you in secret, and will reward you openly. Hey, let me tell you about prayer. Prayer is conversation between you and God. There's not an evaluation. It's not a contest. You're not going to be graded on it. It's not a speech at all. By the way, let me just say, God already knows what's in your heart long before the words ever fall off your lips. You know? So it's a conversation. You know, I know this to be a fact. There are a lot of people that don't go to life group, don't go to small group, don't get involved in Sunday school because they are afraid that a leader in the life group is going to call on them to pray out loud verbally. And they're afraid that in the middle of their prayer, that leader will stop and say, hang on a minute, no, just stop right there. Uh, Brother Jim, would you go ahead now and finish the prayer? This guy's made a mess of it. Yeah? So, so they just don't go, I, I, I'm scared to death that that would uh, happen. Understand something, prayer is not a performance. It is a conversation inside a relationship between you and God, period. I want to ask you a question. Look this way, look this way. Do you know how to talk to other people? I 
then you can talk to God. Because it's that kind of a relationship. I've been here 30, almost 37 years, getting, getting to be close to 37 years. Uh, and there have been thousands of prayers uh, prayed in the 37 years that I've been here. Just thousands of prayers. Um, do I remember any of them? Do you remember any of them? I remember a couple. One Sunday morning, now this, those of you that have been with me for a long time, some of you may remember we had some at 8 o'clock that did remember. I thought I hit it pretty good, but the word got out after a while, you know. So it was the late 80s. We're over in the Sossman Chapel. Places packed to the gills. We're in two services and don't remember which service it is. Right here where I'm standing, <clears throat> that was my office. It was a little white house, okay? Uh, in the Sossaman Chapel, there was a side door that you could go in. In other words, pulpits here, side door is right there. All right, I get up to preach. Music's over, the choir's down, special music's over. I'm behind the pulpit, and it's time for me to preach. And I open my Bible, and I look down, and I had forgotten my notes and had left my notes in the office. And I'm thinking, what in the world am I going to do? And just like that, I remembered that there is this great, good, godly, well-respected, loving man in our church who loved to pray a long time. So I just felt led of the Spirit. <laughs> and I called on him to pray. So he stood up to pray and everybody bowed their head. And as soon as their heads were bowed, pew, boom, right out that side door, lickety split. The flash didn't have anything on me. I got into my office. I got my notes. I came back into the side door got behind the pulpit. He's still praying. I said, yes, Lord. Yes. Amen. Praise God. Yes, that's right. I remember that prayer. The second prayer I'm not going to talk about. It's too embarrassing. I'm not going to tell you. Just suffice it to say that I was praying one Sunday morning and I meant to say one word and another word came out in my mouth that I cannot believe that ever uttered in a church setting. It's none of your business. So here we go. Here we go. The point is, no one remembers. No one is evaluating your prayer life. No one is judging. And by the way, if they are judging your prayer, it's really not your problem. It's their heart problem. Pray without performance. All right, let me give you number three. When you fast, fast without recognition. Fast without recognition. Um, we, we've uh, started a 21-day fast down in the lift. And uh, let me tell you what a fast is. Biblically, a fast is, and we don't talk a whole lot about that because Baptists love to eat. And, uh, you know... <laughs> Americans love to eat. We don't, we don't, we don't talk a whole lot about fasting. But, but fasting is uh, setting aside food for a specific period of time so that while you are fasting without the food, you dedicate that time that you normally would be eating, you dedicate that time to worship and to praying and to seeking God and to deepen your relationship with God. Now, the lift is, they're on a fast right now, uh, 21 days, and, and they're doing it a little bit differently. Some of them are fasting Starbucks for 21 days, and some of them Diet Cokes for 21 days, and something that, you know, is kind of a, mm, may, maybe a, very, a big habit to them, a, a big value to them, and so they're going to lay it aside and what they would normally do, but they're, they're going to give it to God, okay? So, so, so here, here's the deal. It's interesting to me that people talk about fasting while they're fasting. And they'll walk up to you and they'll say, 
Well, first of all, what, what did the word say? What, what's it clear? Can, can, we, can we read that right here beginning in verse 16? Moreover, we, we haven't read that yet, have we? You know, when you, let me tell you something about preaching three times on Sunday. You forget when you're up here, did I say that or not? I knew I said it, but did I say it in this service or did I say it? But anyway, here we go. Moreover, when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites. And they walk around with a sad expression on their face as the hypocrites. For they disfigure their face that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, it's all the reward they're ever going to get. But you, when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that you may appear not unto men to fast, but unto your Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward you openly. But it's so interesting to me that when people do fast, they want to tell you about it. Hey, brother, pray for me. I'm fasting. I know that I, I've lost a little bit of weight, but I just want you to know I'm not on a diet and I'm not sick. I'm fasting. I may look a little thinner to you right now, but just know that, 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 that I am fasting. And, and by the way, brother, I, I, I thank you for the invitation to go to Chick-fil-A with you. And yeah, I'll go, but just know that when I get there, I'm just going to drink a little water. I'll sit at the table with you while you eat your nuggets, but I can't eat because I'm fasting. It's just people love to talk about it. And the Bible says you need to be, be careful. Jesus gets grossed out at that kind of stuff. He says don't let your religious actions get you recognition. If you're out for human rewards, so be it. But that's all you're ever going to get. When you give... Don't do it to gain attention. When you pray, don't do it as a performance. When you fast, keep it to yourself. Don't walk around like this. Get up, take a shower, get cleaned up, comb your hair and look like somebody. That's what Jesus says. Now all three of these things, giving, praying, fasting, really are tools and instruments that can get you a closer connection to God than you've ever experienced. It will enhance, they will enhance your spiritual maturity and they can empower you really to be a lot different than you've ever been uh, in your life. But the key, listen, the key is the motivation. Do you do those things to please him or do you do those things to gain the approval of people and to be recognized? You, know, you understand, here's something that, 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 that I, I want to pour into you today. I really want to give you something. When, when, when I find myself in a little bit of a performance mode and, and I'm, I'm acting like something that's really not real in my heart, in my life, here, here's the deal. Here's what, here's what causes that. Y'all want to know what causes it? I've forgotten how much God cares about me. When I feel like that I have to act like, talk like, and be like what somebody else expects me to act like, talk like, and be like, I've really forgotten how much God cares about me. The first words I ever heard God say to me, you say audibly, louder than that. He said to me, I love you just like you are. First thing I ever heard God say, I love you. And I've never been the same since, but there are times that I forget that. And this is why God sent some of you. I, I'm, I'm convinced of this. I, I believe the Holy Spirit really labeled this in my heart before I ever got here today, is that there are a lot of people that are in this room right now that you, you need to hear how much God loves you and cares about you. The word says if he cares about a flower that springs up and, and, and blossoms and blooms and, and it's there for a little while and then it just fades and just rots away. If God cares about them, don't you think that he cares about you? God cares about you. And you don't have to perform for people. You just need an audience of one. 
It's not the masses of people that you need to try to impress. God already knows about your heart. And he deeply, deeply loves you. And I, I watch this down through my ministry. So many people come to Jesus through the process of elimination. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, they go out into the world and they try everything that there is to try in the world and it creates such a pain in them. And, and finally, after they've tried everything else, then they finally get to Jesus and Jesus changes their life forever. I want you to hear my heart a minute. You don't have to be pained by everything out there in the world. God loves you just like you are and you can come to him this morning and you don't have to go through that pain. You don't have to go through that suffering. You say, Pastor, do you really believe that I can be a true, genuine, real, bona fide disciple of Jesus Christ? Absolutely. I know you can, but you can't do it in your own strength. The only way that you can do it is in the power of the Holy Spirit who wants to live his life in you and through you. Now, I'm not calling you to be religious. Don't you even hear me say that? Jesus got ticked off at the religious crowd. He called them a bunch of hypocrites. He called them a bunch of snakes. One time he called them a bunch of whitewashed tombstones. You've got all of the appearance outside that you're alive, but on the inside there's nothing life about you. You're dead and lifeless on the inside. I want you to see a passage that, that I'm, I'm going to tell you it's mind-blowing. Um, in, in my uh, mentoring group, we, we really, we, we really uh, we got hold of this verse not too long ago, and it, it was just an eye-opener. But Matthew chapter 7, look at verse 21 with me, okay? Look at verse 21. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. In other words, there are a lot of pretenders who are pretending to have a relationship with Jesus that are giving, praying, displaying. He said, not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, but shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me, Lord, didn't we preach in your name? In your name, didn't we cast out demons? In your name, haven't we done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. If you're a pretender today, I'm really calling you as your pastor to a new level of honesty. It's so easy to pretend. We, we've learned how to play the part. You know what I call them? You know what I call them? Costco shoppers. I love to go to Costco. Absol my wife, she, she's just flabbergasted at my desire to go with her when she goes to Costco. I love to go to Costco. But here's what I found out about Costco shoppers. There are a bunch of people that claim to be Costco shoppers who are just in there for the free samples. That's what he's talking about here in the Word. That's exactly what he's talking about here in the Word. We've learned how to pretend. How many of you would agree it's easy to play the part? Easy to play the part. You, you, you know, I told you about when I was growing up as a kid. Nobody knew that I'd turned my back on God. Nobody knew that I'd seen the hypocrisy in the church and had come to the place that said, God, if that's the best you can do, I don't need you. But I found the, the only real Christian that I'd ever known in my life, and I, I, I immediately fell in love with her. I told her on the first date that I was going to marry her, okay? But I knew one of the values that she had in her life was that she was going to date and she would marry a godly man. I learned to play the part. 
I put the mask on. I dressed up in the disguise. And I learned how to play it well. I sang in front of thousands of people because I knew what that did in her heart and her life. And so I just pretended. I pretended. I learned. We, we, we can play the part. Many people today play the part. But I wonder how many of you may be sitting here this morning that you have a desire. I don't want to play the part anymore. I don't want to pretend anymore. I have a desire in my heart today that I want the genuine, real thing. I, I, I don't care what people think about me anymore. All I care about is this audience of one, and I want his approval. I don't want the accolades of man. I don't want the applause of people anymore. All I care about is that I please him. Is that your desire today? then if that's your desire, I want you to make a decision this morning. I want you to get up from where you are and I want you to come down here to the front and I want you by walking here to the front, let the world know, let God know, I'm tired of this. I want to be genuine. I want to be real. And I'm making a decision today that from now on, it's going to be God and God alone that I'm going to live my life to please Watch this in the latter part of, verse, uh, of chapter 7. Notice verse 28. It came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were amazed. They were astonished. I'm going to tell you something. When God says, I care about you, it crushed me. I came to that place in my life. I said, I don't really care what people think anymore. I mean, I broke out into convulsions, and here I am. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm five foot eight and a half. I weighed 170 pounds. I had a 30 inch waist. I was, I, I, I was a man's man, and I didn't care anymore what people thought about me. All I cared about was God cares about me, and He loves me. You know what? I've been amazed at him ever since. I've been amazed at him ever since. And if you'll make that decision, if that desire is there, and you'll make that decision to turn away from being a pretender to an authentic, genuine, bona fide follower of Jesus, there'll never be another day in your life that you won't be amazed at Jesus. Would you stand with me and let's pray together? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for this great moment of life change that's going to occur in a lot of people. And I, I pray now, oh, Father, that everybody here will understand how important that this moment is. God, we won't do anything to distract and we won't do anything to take away from the moment. God, we don't know who, is, who it is that's around us that you're dealing with. And God, help, help us not to be guilty of such a distraction that may quench the spirit in their heart and their life. And I pray for those that you are dealing with. I pray for those that have this desire that are sick and tired of, of living a lie. They're sick and tired of, of, of having circumstances and situations that arise in their life that put pressure on them to pretend that God, that today for the first time in their life, you'd set them free from that performance trap and just be real and genuine to them. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.